Good day from around the world. I'm Kyle Ellicott, your host uh, for another edition of VCTV. It's Friday. What does that mean? We've got a ton of energy. We've got great investors, and we're going to be talking about fundraising. This is the common theme we talk about every day here on VCTV. But today, unlike previous episodes when we've talked about various technologies like artificial intelligence, space, deep technologies, blockchain, food, bio, med tech, you name it, we've talked about it here. Today, we're going to talk about the overarching climate of fundraising and what's happening around the world in different regions, along with the industry as a whole. So that way, you, our audience, can be educated if you're looking to make investments, where the opportunities are, and where you should be paying attention to. And if you're fundraising, what to keep in mind going to fundraise over the next six to 12 months. A lot is happening. A lot is changing. You need to know this information to be prepared to be successful. Now, with that being said, thank you for joining us today. A big shout out to Elena and to the entire LA Token team for bringing VCTV to you, wherever you may be and whatever type of screen you're watching on, we appreciate everybody and you're tuning in. If you like what you're hearing today, make sure you click the subscribe button and at any time, give us a thumbs up. We love them. Uh, and that way we can bring more great content to you. If you have comments, questions, it's Friday, a lot to talk about. Feel free to drop them in the comments box. I'll do my best to ask them in real time. If not, all of us, as you will find out, are available on social media just about 24 seven, or as Gary will tell us a little bit about, we might have smart assistants who can help respond a little faster to you uh, as well. But We've got a great show for you. I don't want to take any more time, but again, a big shout out to Elena and to the entire LA Token team for making this possible today. Let's go ahead and introduce all of our investors who have joined us from around the world. Some old friends, hey Mark, uh, and some new ones, Maya and Mont, who are here. I want to welcome everybody, but let's go around with introductions, a little background, and then we'll get into the topic at hand. Eduardo, Brady Bunch style, you are right in my queue. I'm going to start with you. Introduction, a little background on yourself, please. Yeah, thanks, Kylie. Uh, thanks, Elena. Thanks to all the, the La Token team. Uh, again, a fantastic group of uh, you know professionals and panelists. And uh, very, very pleased to, to be here uh, uh, this Friday in this uh, very interesting uh, discussion, actually. You know, um, pretty much... Many people of the audience uh, know me actually, so uh, because I've been here also a few times before. Um, I basically um, I'm the uh, regional director for uh, EMEA for large US family office. So we have experience on uh, private equity, venture capital, also real estate and, and straight equities and bonds actually. Um, experience on fundraising, we are in the middle of uh, an ICO also with blockchain, with FinTech, within those particular uh, areas of investments, artificial intelligence, that kind of things. And uh, yeah, I mean, really, really looking forward at uh, taking a look at uh, Roberto's uh, pitch and, and uh, to give you um, my, my feedback. So, yeah. Wonderful. ICOs, STOs, IEOs, O's and O's and O's. We're going to exactly. come back on that topic. Yeah, we're okay. going to come back to talk about that today as well. Um, next up, Mons, welcome to the show. We are talking a little off offline. It's a pleasure to have you. Uh, please, same as well. A little introduction, a little background on yourself, and, and we'll continue from there. Thank you so much, Kyle. Um, I, I, I basically run a consulting practice where we work with ventures across the world and help them with scaling up their businesses uh, from all the way to uh, you know, early stage to mid stage to growth, and uh, it's it's a total pleasure being here, and look forward to you know uh, having some good insights uh, from everyone. Awesome. And do you focus on any particular industries or just stages? Uh, barring fintech, I uh, you know I found that I've been able to work with uh, almost all ventures across. It doesn't take me much time to you know work with ventures and get them uh, going. Uh, thankfully, we have the gift of problem solving. But uh, fintech is one area where. Uh, we don't really focus way too much. Uh, barring fintech, we look at we are more than happy to work with ventures across. Right on. Well, welcome to the show. Next up, the grandmaster, the chief architect, the biggest name in the game when it comes to artificial intelligence. 
Gary, welcome who, back who to the show. Who are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> I am not sure well, who you're talking about. <laughs> I mean, it's just, you just, it just, I look at you and I see artificial intelligence the most beautiful way, but for everyone else out there, a little intro, a little background on you. Sure. My name's Gary Fowler and I've done 15 startups. The biggest exit I've been involved with is Click Software. We sold for $1.35 billion seven months ago. I started Eva, which is one of the top 10 AI companies in HR tech four years ago. It's about a $700 million company today. Uh, I own GSD. I'm the co-founder of GSD Venture Studios, which is a premier um, AI studio. And we uh, scour the world to looking for the most incredible uh, AI technologies that'll have an impact from space tech to security. I mean, you name it. AI is the new electricity. And our job is to take companies that are wanting to grow to the next levels. So thanks Absolutely. for and, and hey, pleasure to have you. People are loving AI as the new electricity and, and, and agreeing and doing nothing but agreeing with you. And it's it's a powerful statement that to your audience, if you haven't heard much about, I guarantee you we're going to get into it. We're going to drop the word AI. If we haven't already five times, we're going to get there. So get ready. It's a very important topic. Maya, we got a chance to talk off show for just a few minutes. I want to welcome you. I did a little research before the show. You are outstanding and have a crazy massive background. I'm excited to dive into today. You're also in a very exciting region that we've talked a little bit about on the show that I'm, I'm really interested to dive further into because there's a lot of activity there, but I don't want to steal too much of your thunder. Just want to give you a good welcoming, but a little background, a little intro on yourself. Yeah, great. Uh, my name is Maya Horgan Fumodu. I run a $10 million venture capital fund. We focus on Nigeria, Kenya, Ghana, and Egypt. We also recently launched a nonprofit, Ingresso for Good, and we do micro scholarships, technical skills development, and talent placement for African youth. Um, as far as our fund, what differentiates us in the African market is about 80% of our own limited partners. So the investors in our fund run some of the world's top global funds. So the idea is that we're essentially a feeder fund for some of the world's top investment firms. Um, yeah, uh, our portfolio ranges, we, we really like uh, B2B technology or tech-enabled solutions, um, mainly, mainly companies, tech-enabled businesses that target Africa's traditional billion-dollar sectors, whether that's um, agriculture technology or um, energy technology, et cetera, et cetera, financial services technology. That's mainly where we invest. And that's me. I love it. And like I said, we've had the pleasure of having a few other guests from the region around here and have talked extensively about Africa. I'm incredibly bullish myself about it. I think there's some great opportunities. We've talked a lot about fintech uh, here as well and what's happening within the region. And uh, uh, funny enough, energy and agriculture came up a few episodes ago here on BCTV around Africa and the opportunity there. So get ready, we're coming back. And last but not least, and I gotta grab my, my coffee. Mark, <laughs> you went offline for a second there. Oh, I no, grabbed my cup of coffee to cheers, my fellow coffee drinker. Mark, <laughs> welcome back to the show in Seattle. It's a pleasure to have you. A little intro and background on yourself as well. Oh, Gary, I sure. see you, I'll give you a cheers too. <laughs> uh, as I said, coffee, Seattle, I mean, it goes hand in hand, right, from Starbucks. But my background is uh, with, the other, with the other big company here with Microsoft. Um, I left my, or retired about 10 years ago. Uh, I do investment, mostly angel investments since then. Um, I'm a member of the Alliance of Angels, of uh, Spawn Fund, of the American Capital Association. And we invest in any kind of, theoretically, in any kind of early startups. We have a quite diverse portfolio. Um, based on the technology background, I'm in the blockchain space since about 2014. I've written a couple of books in that space, but mostly driving investments. I'm also um, co-managing an investor group called Codex 3, the third generation of the ledger. Um, we are in Super Angel, north of California. So we do um, any kind of investment in the blockchain space. You mentioned all the IEOs. So we do tokens, we do equity, um, and anything in between. Um, and uh, always looking for interesting projects. And, uh, Wonderful. Awesome. Well, everybody, welcome again to our audience. We got a great show for you. 
You got a huge diverse group of investors here. And anytime, if you've got questions, drop them in. We've got uh, plenty of time to talk about them today. And Roberto, I'll give you a quick shout out. We're going to get to you in the second half of the show, but you're sitting on camera for the next about 40 minutes. So I just wanted to say hi to you and make sure uh, uh, people knew you weren't just uh, Zoom bombing us or anything. Instead, you're you're here and you're part of the show. So we'll get to you shortly. But Panelists, investors, let's talk a little bit about something. And you know, like we talked about off show, past six months, we talked a lot here on VCTV about how the pandemic and just the world has changed around fundraising, okay, globally, right? But now let's talk about what things are happening currently and what does the next six to 12 months look like? So we'd love to get each of your opinions on the current state of, of fundraising, investment, and also what's to come in the future. So that may be you as a, uh, as a fund, uh, so Maya and others that may have re raised a fund recently, but also from a startup's perspective, you know, how are you seeing your investments play out as well? So Eduardo, let's start back with you. Uh, what is the current state of fundraising uh, as you see it today? Yeah, thanks, Kylie. Well, actually right now, uh, and during this, uh, you know, uh, particular, um, Area, I will say of uh, pandemics and uh, global, you know, challenges. Actually, we are finding we investors are finding, you know, um, hard times actually uh, when it comes to to fundraising. I mean, we have postponed an ICO and an STO actually because of this kind of uh, you know uh, worries uh, of uh, investors on a worldwide basis. Uh, but hopefully, I mean, uh, we believe that the situation will uh, um, come back to normal uh, probably by the end of the year. Hopefully, we'll get, you know, new, uh, basically, uh, drugs and treatments for, for the disease. And, uh, and investors will start, you know, uh, changing their minds. But uh, honestly, right now, actually, the, the, uh, the market is quite silent when it comes to, to fundraising. And we are invested in in particular industry that have been heavily hit by these kind of things actually which are basically in our particular case fintech blockchain and, and artificial intelligence so uh, i mean we are optimistic because we believe uh, that uh, probably after the summer uh things will start to get normal but we will see i mean uh, who knows um, if uh, there are other outbreaks uh, in Europe, you're probably aware of the news. I mean, in Spain, we're having some problems. Also in some other countries, such as Germany and, and France and Italy. But uh, we are kind of optimistic for, for the uh, um, latest month uh, of, uh, of the year, definitely. Yeah, it's going to be a it's gonna be a wild Q3 and Q4. Uh, exactly, it could exactly. be a sprint to the holidays for sure, um, which will be interesting to see. Uh, Mark, how about yourself? I mean, you're you're invested in a similar industry as Eduardo, but also, I mean, you're here here in the states and maybe seeing a little bit different, uh, you know, deal flow on the on the West Coast. What is the current state from your view of of fundraising as it stands? I think it's a very, very, very interesting time in many ways, of course. Um, on one side, and it, uh, on one side, I think we see a lot of cash on the sidelines. Um, mm -hmm. There has been so much uh, money coming into the economy and companies through the government programs, but it has been also before, I think a lot of investors were starting to get out of um, the traditional equity markets and trying to figure out where can I get safety as well as in return. It's really the hunt for the return that has been driving um, a lot of us over the last, I would say, six, seven months, even pre-COVID. But um, what happened, I think, is over the last four or five months is the deal flow itself has changed. I think people are much more careful with new investments. On the other hand, though, um, there's a lot of interest, appetite uh, to help existing portfolio companies. So companies that have already, that we are already invested in, we are engaging very closely with the leadership and uh, making sure they have access to the latest information, to government programs, um, to have help and coaching of how to make sure they prepare themselves through this phase. And then of course, uh, if by necessary, we help with cash as well, because um, we want the companies to succeed. Those are the companies we've already built relationships in. We trust them. We've seen them um, moving forward and doing the right steps. And I think we're going to keep working with them for sure. 
um, through these through these times. Um, having said that, there is a huge appetite, as I said, for investments. I can't. I mean, I can tell you, we are involved in a in a uh, in a project outside of the blockchain space that uh, raised um, ten million dollars another uh, uh, path to closing that closing twelve million just within the next. Uh, um, I would say total fundraising time of six weeks. So I can't tell too much about it, but if it's the right spot and the right, there are opportunities right now, there's nearly an unlimited amount of cash to go into those things. Such a tease, giving us yeah, the, 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 the intro of a pull them back, but I, Give it I another agree. six weeks and it's public. So yes, but I can tell you what it is, but it's, awesome. uh, it's, it's, it's really interesting. Elena, let's let's call them out on that. In six weeks, Mark, we're having you back, and I so would be six weeks in one day. All right, sounds good, so, Gary. Sounds good. <laughs> Elena's got you. We got you got corded. So we're we're coming back to you on that. Get ready, Gary. To you, same question. I mean, what are you seeing? We talked a lot about this yesterday and the day before around you know deep deep technologies, more infrastructure based technologies for those in, who weren't able to tune in yesterday, and things like AI. What are you seeing as the current state of fundraising? Well, so, I mean, it goes back to, you know, I call the KISS principle, right? Keep it simple, stupid. So if you got a good team, you're focused in incredible technology and you have revenue. I mean, I have a company that started a year ago that's doing 10 million, over 10 million in revenue now. We'll double this year to 20. I got another one that's a recent startup that's a 2.7 with a $100 million pipeline. I mean, so... If you look at it, you know, AI is the new electricity. And if we invest in things that are going to grow exponentially, this is the time. I mean, Warren Buffett doesn't go with the flow. You got to look at where's the opportunity. Now they're discounts. So I would look at one is revenue. I would look at the team first and foremost. And I would look at what that technology can do to the market and what kind of impact. So from my standpoint, I'm closing a $2 million round right now with one of my aging in place companies out of Japan. Uh, I think there is an appetite, but you got to find the right kind of investors. And we talked about it before, Kyle, this digital transformation, accepting that business is going to be done on Zoom, right? We've got to go with the new way of doing business. We can't stay in the old mindset. We really have to think differently. And now's the time to do it. And if you don't do it, and if they're slow, they're going to fall behind. Because these opportunities, the next billion dollar companies are there and ready to be invested in. So yes, you can put money on the sideline. You know, I'm also an investor. I've created so several large funds, a $10 million seed fund for my acceleration uh, group out of Russia. I mean, it's, it's the time. Now, you know, I personally went through this situation. So in 1998, we brought a company over from Israel. We brought that company to the US. The market started that was great, the internet boom. Then the market turned in 2000 and things died. They said we would never do an IPO in NASDAQ. March, the, it died. In June, I did the IPO. We raised money. Then they said we would never survive. We survived. That company, Click Software, which I was on the original management team, was sold for $1.35 billion in August of last year. So, and I'm not taking credit for the, the whole deal on it, but I can tell you that believing it and moving forward helped us. They said we were going to go bankrupt. We didn't. They said we wouldn't do a NASDAQ IPO. And we did. They said it couldn't be sold and it was sold. So you have to, you know, have the right grit and get stuff done. As I told you, my company, GSD Venture Studios, is Get Shit Done Venture Studios. Because <laughs> that's really what it's all about. It's, it's true. I mean, look, no matter what the climate is, things are going to be tough, right? That's the joy or the pain or something in between of building a, a company, right? You're, you're putting yourself out there. It's not going to be easy. If it was easy, everyone Everybody would have done would it. Do it. <laughs> Exactly. Exactly. So it's so, always hard as an entrepreneur, right? It's never easy. If it was easy, there would be a lot more Mark Zuckerbergs, right? A lot more Peter Thiels. It would be a lot more Elon Musk. But it ain't easy. I mean, absolutely. We, so and this, these types, these types of times, and kind of what we've seen. This, and, and when I say times, I want to be very clear to the audience. Since again, we're we're shifting coming into the second half of the, of 2020. This is the time of opportunity. 
new markets, new services, new opportunities are being created that can be taken advantage of or shifted into. This is a very unique time to build or start building in and refocusing. And we've talked about it here on VCTV. I'm shamelessly plugging us, but it's true. Being an entrepreneur, similar to all of our guests and an investor as well, this is a big, big chance to shift or to try something new that, I mean, for the decades to come, the types of technologies we talk about are going to be here. And Maya, I, I want to come to you. I mean, you, you're, you're, you're based in, an, again, in a region that's thriving, I would argue, in terms of opportunity, where you can build and, and investment. You've also just raised a fund. You're making investments. So you've got a big, broad picture of what the current state is around fundraising. Would love to hear your thoughts on this. Yeah, my general thought. So, so I want to break it out into both um, investor to investor and then investor to port portfolio company uh, fundraising. And on the LP side, um, what I'm finding, or, or firstly, the, the general amongst the two, because I've been on a number of calls with both like limited partners and institutional funds, as well as as, as other VC funds like this. Um, what I find from the institutional, yeah, there's been a, a, a pull back on the H and I and family office as far as um, as far as uh, liquidity and, and and real quick H and I high net worth individuals continue yes high net worth individuals and as far as um, liquidity and willingness to participate due to perceived wealth and so I've noticed a, a sort of decline on that side but institutional funds as well as any any other sort of um, institutional like venture capital fund, private equity funds, we all have mandates and we all have required deployment of capital. And so even in a down market, we just like, just like every other organization has to figure out how to continue to do business in a pandemic market or in a market where you have to do Zoom calls to close. You know, we, um, we fortunately closed our, our, so we have a sovereign wealth fund and a number of, of, of high profile fund of funds from the U.S. who've commit to the fund. Um, but, and we fortunately closed on them before um, the pandemic hit, but I've heard a number of them continuing to do investments and also understanding how they're going to get around the whole trust building in person. And then, so that shifts me to the, the, um, the, the B or the the venture capital side and the actual people who are deploying funds into portfolio companies like us. Uh, again, to reiterate that point, it's only going to negatively affect my IRR. Um, and I, I don't know if you want to stop and explain that as well. <laughs> but um, no, no, it's only you're going fine. To I just okay. sometimes there's terms that may not be common to everyone. So I okay. just wanted to jump in on that one, but sorry, totally. continue. Yeah. No problem. No problem. Um, it's only going to jeopardize my IRR if I hold a bunch of my investors' money and don't deploy it because I don't have a market that I'm used to. It, it serves me to understand the new market as quickly as possible and understand the proxies that I have to develop, develop for my traditional trust building, which is what we're all facing. And I actually, we just closed our largest investment to date um, about, what, three weeks ago into a company, like I've never met the founders before. So, uh, well, I, I, before, preceding the investment, I had never met them in person. Of course, we had our Zoom calls and da da da. But then there are so many ways. It's like when you're investing, you really have to break down what am I trying to solve for in my diligence process where I do want to meet these people in person and where I do want to go to the office and figure out ways in which you can solve for that, like doing more letters of or doing more recommendations, talking to the investors who've been working with them for years and understanding their experience, talking to their customers and doing extensive customer diligence and also sitting or having individual Zoom calls with team members and ensuring is there a unanimous understanding of the mission? And and the vision of the business is what they say is what the CEO says exactly what the you know analysts and the salespeople are saying. There are ways that you can solve for those proxies for trust building. And yeah, the market is different. And there are some places where I'm just not going to participate because I'm like, I don't know what's going to happen to that in a month. Like, probably not going to do a lot of hospitality, hospitality or travel. Flights are not a thing right now. Um, yeah, and like that that that's to say, like we saw a jet, uh, a private jet company in Nigeria that was. Um, uh, his valuation was around 60 million, uh, maybe five months ago now. And now they're at about a 7 million and then just dropped a little bit further. So like those, those, those industries we're, we're taking a break from, but as far as, um, companies that are focused on, um, remote work services, as far as businesses that are focused on, um, anything that brings transparency to balance sheets and helps, uh, founders optimize on margins, on performance, on tracking of inventory, things like that. 
as well as your traditional B2C uh, or, or B2B financial services, infrastructure, internet, things that are really thriving in this market and will continue to thrive after COVID. That's what we're really excited about. That's, that's awesome. You bring up a really solid point that uh, I think tends to be forgotten, and that's diligence. And diligence in a time where, you know, we're not able to meet as much in person is very focused around uh, going longer in that diligence process. Traditionally, it's been, hey, we like you. Let's have a few meetings. Let's go through your Dropbox folder and you know, if we have any questions, we'll follow up. If not, let's let's go to town. Obviously, I'm simplifying it, but that's that's where yes. it was traditionally. Now you're, I mean, you're bringing up. We've talked about it here before, and even further is like diligence is not just about a Dropbox folder. It's not just about one conversation. It's multiple conversations. Team members, be prepared to, to allow your team members to talk with investors. You're going to get you know asked for recommendations, customers customer recommendations, investor, why you're bringing up a good point that's uh, typically kind of just been um, pushed the sidelines because people just think, oh, well, it's just going to be just as fast. No, 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 no. Take take time. I mean, how long, just curious, the, the company you mentioned again, how, how long was it from when you first met them to when you guys decided to make the investment? Is that period? So in Interestingly, yeah, interestingly enough. So when we are, um, it, it was, a, so to, to, to kill the punchline at the beginning, oops, um, mm -hmm. it was shorter in this, this period, actually, in closing this investment was shorter because mind you, I live in Lagos, which has the third top three worst traffic in the world. So in those, mm -hmm. even if I am having significantly less, uh, you know, founder interactions, and I'm just maybe going to their office, having a coffee two, three times, my days are typically filled with two hours of traffic in the morning, two hours of traffic in the, in the evening or something along that. So it, it's, it's, it's just to even get to them. And then and this is a very specific Nigeria factor. The infrastructure really sucks. And so having those in-person meetings takes up a lot of my day and, it, and, and causes just that, the transport and the logistics alone causes de uh, deals to be delayed. And the other thing is um, it's actually quite a quick process to be able to schedule 30 minute, 45 minute, boom, 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 customer service uh, calls and uh, investor review calls, et cetera, et cetera. As opposed to this nebulous thing of like, my gut tells me that the founder is the one, you know, this is really based on, on true and solid facts that you can, you can solve for them sort of instantaneously. So we found that the, 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 the real factual diligence points, the, the quantitative and tangible information that we needed to be able to assess the competence, the integrity, the, the trustworthiness of the founder based on their interactions with their customers, peers, employees, and investors is a relatively streamlined process. So this one, it took us about one month from the time we had our first meeting from, to the time when we wired the check, whereas uh, it normally can take about between 45 and 90 days um, when the, the, we have our usual market dynamics where our, my day is filled with, you know, investor pitches and, you know, traveling to the mainland and da 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 all that kind of stuff. <laughs> the, the fun yet boring stuff. Uh, but uh, the... <laughs> And, and I joke because it was mentioned on yesterday's call. Mark's even getting a little smile about that over there too. It's uh, you, you're right. I mean, now you don't have to travel, so that that time you have available is actually increased, which means now you're not going back and forth, you know, bouncing between people's schedules, and so things can appear faster, but there's still a higher frequency. I think is is the point here. So mm -hmm. again, rather than a few meetings in a 45 to 90 day period, and some other things. Instead, there's a lot more happening in a shorter amount of period. So founders, mm -hmm. take note. Thank you, Maya. Mons, I want to come to you. Same to you. I mean, you're working with companies at early, mid, growth stage. I know it's different between all of these, but what are you seeing in terms of the overall fundraising landscape right now, uh, currently with these, these companies that you may be working with? So I'll be very specific to India at the moment. Uh, you know, looking at the data right now, you know, we, we had 50 deals happening per month between January to April. And right now, as, as we look at May 2020, we've had just 20. So the VC investments are definitely coming down in, in terms of the number of deals which are there. In terms of value of investments, the amount invested in May 2020 is one-fourth that what was invested in May 2019. 
uh, this is very, again i'm keeping it very specific to india mm-hmm. uh, mm-hmm. as uh, you know some of the panel members shared right now obviously most of the rounds which are happening are happening less into new ventures and they're more in rounds or bridge rounds uh, where you know you have already established the trust with the founders and the founding team you have some understanding uh, with respect to you know the capability and you know what the traction in the market looks like whether there's an opportunity where uh, they can uh, you know operate and you know probably get some uh, you know uh, advantage if they were to double down in terms of uh, the new landscape which is there uh, early stage investments again looking at the figures it's you know it used to be uh, 60% of startups in 2019 and right now it's only 16% of startups in 2020 so that's something which is there but having said that you know uh, to gary's point i think gary had mentioned about the team and you know uh, the new uh, and and my had mentioned about you know the opportunities out there if you look mm-hmm. at specific to india you would have definitely heard of a company called reliance uh, geo platforms so they raised something like 15.5 billion dollars by selling just a 25% stake since april this year so that's uh, you know that's a company uh, which is owned by mukesh ambani the richest indian and mm-hmm. uh, you know currently they have a valuation of 65 billion dollars uh where we see some of the investments going down uh, in terms of other sectors we also have sectors such as uh, fintech healthcare and edtech which are now taking a lead uh, given the new landscape so we look at things like you know increased data consumption we look at offline behavior coming to online we look at concepts like social distancing we look like things like you know zero touch policy uh, digital transactions going up uh, there's also a need for loans because obviously uh, the times are such that you know a lot of uh, things uh are definitely going down in terms of you know uh, businesses uh, in uh, quite a few sectors uh, in terms of uh, also an upcoming recession which is up out there right so now uh, coming specifically again to the sectors which are seeing some investments uh, we've seen 14 edtech startups uh, raise uh, venture capital funding in india for healthcare it's eight startups for fintech it's 11 startups uh there's one more concern which we're looking at uh you've mentioned that we should not you know talk about politics so i'll keep it just a single line uh we have okay. some <laughs> so so we have uh you know we are looking at some uh border skirmish and you know there's some india china thing which is happening so that's going to you know have an impact in terms of you know outside investments and you know but it also opens up investments for others for example sequoia has right uh, right now launched a 1.3 billion dollar fund which is very specific to southeast asia and india so uh mm-hmm. it'll be interesting in the you know uh, uh, upcoming months but uh it's definitely going to be i mean like you know played uh, to to a huge extent it's going to be you know dictated by the kind of a uh, team that you have the kind of uh, capability in terms of execution that you'll bring to the table and how you're able to leverage and you know keep your head down either you know try to survive you know cut down all the burn and just try to focus on where the company needs to survive or you know if you're in a position where you can actually leverage on the new landscape you know how you able to you know really work on it and double down uh, so that's something we are seeing in india right now that's amazing and i think you bring up another point or, or around just southeast asia and some of the activity there is it's very important right now to to also focus on your customers focus on what could be your localized market right traditionally companies wanted to go big day one be the biggest company in the world and it's like okay let's take a pause let's focus on our local market let's focus on our core product and let's still be a global company and and grow into that right maybe it's not necessary to launch five new locations around the world instead focus on for for the companies you mentioned focus on the india market right focus on the korean market focus on the indonesia market because those markets are a plenty and when you succeed locally you can have a better chance of success globally and to Maya's point as well and yours is you know investors they you know you really want to look at capital local and then start to succeed and go global when Maya comes back to you and I imagine she, she may come up further on this you know she's going to call your previous investors like she said and she's going to want to know who those investors are why did they invest in you in those local markets and what changes have you had and that's very important so very very important to those out there is focus on those local markets now more than ever because again mm-hmm. things have changed in the dynamic mark you've got to come and go for it no absolutely and i really said of course i have to pitch one of our companies but uh, like when you mentioned indonesia and i think that track that 
So Pundi X, when I met the investor, uh, so the two founders, uh, we brought them to Davos. We usually, we go to Davos every year. We take the CEOs of some of our companies with us. The so last year was uh, Rune from Maker. Um, and uh, I think three years ago, we took the guys from Pundi X. So we're basically just trying to figure out how do we get access to completely unbanked um, farmers in Indonesia to the financial system, access to insurance, uh, insurance markets, all kinds of things that they did just didn't have access to. We helped them to get access to capital, but also to, to advise us, I think, around the board. And they are now active in, I think, 30 countries. Um, the team is doing quite well. Uh, we have, of course, been very happy with our investments. Uh, they're launching now from the plus purely payment. They launched their own chain, like the FX change is now live as well. So Testnet is live. So um, it's great to see teams and help them um, to develop from a specific scenario, really global, I think really globally and see them and see them thriving. And this is just one of the highlights, I think, for us as investors to see entrepreneurs succeeding. And, you know, you and Mons also brought up some good points. So Mons brought up microloans and insurance or excuse me, uh, education. You brought up insurance tech in general. Where, Mark, I'm going to start with you back is where are the areas of opportunity right now that you're seeing? So where are you seeing money that's either uh, or industries that are plentiful for, for cash investment or that you're starting to look at, you know, to Maya's point that you're learning as rapidly as you can, because you know, that's going to be a hot sector. Where are the opportunities? Uh, so, I mean, Maya, Gary, I mean, you guys made, you guys made very, very good points. I mean, we are, the world is completely changing. You're absolutely right. I think uh, companies, um, we are getting used to this, that, or those companies and organizations that are getting used to working in the virtual world um, on a global scale, leveraging talent from all around the world, enabling and unlocking that talent and the experiences. I think those are the companies we are going after. And it can be, um, I mean, it can, often they're startups and we're looking for them, of course, but it, it's also, I think, established players. If you see how well companies, let's say like Amazon, Best Buy and Costco um, adopted to, to the new world versus uh, traditional players that were far behind, I think you, we will see a very, very quickly um, divergence and we see them already in those industries. And I think it's a huge opportunity for startups. I mean, the event space has changed completely um, from a full calendar around the world. And um, I would say I do, I do miss drinks on rooftops in Singapore. I have to say that was uh, definitely something um, <clears throat> um, I had, I had uh, good memories of um, and I was looking forward this year. But um, Maya said it before, I mean, the, if you don't have to commute, you're working from your office uh, globally, um, it's so much easier to get things done efficiently. Um, and if you, and I think uh, Gary mentioned earlier, it's about the teams, the trust you have in those teams. If you can build on relationships, you can build on referrals, you know that people are real, um, things can move very, very quickly. I think you're, you're spot on, Gary. I, I mean, what's, what are you seeing as opportunities? We talked a lot about some of these areas yesterday, but I think you might have a few more as well. So what are you seeing as areas of opportunity for investment right now? I mean, anything, you know, in, in a point, uh, anything, as Mark said, that aids in a digital transformation. And the key, you know, is I just, I wrote an article, I don't know if it was in Forbes or in on Medium, but about intergenerational teams, we got to look differently, right? We need people that have experience as part of these teams. I think we talked about this before, Kyle, yeah. but we need to have those kind of experience because we can have a founder, but we have to have people that have the contacts. Contacts are incredibly important. I've heard it time and time again today. You know, it's about having that network and the contacts. And if people have invested in you before, if they know who you are, it's surely a lot easier to raise money. That's door number Absolutely. one. Multicultural teams, diversity gives a lot of opportunity. In fact, on the board of GSD as one of uh, the board members of the NAACP. And I did this, you know, uh, a year ago, right? And I did it because diversity is critically important. And then at the same time, regionally diverse, use teams. So I have R&D teams in Russia, Belarus, Ukraine, uh, Israel. I look for the best talent create a mix. Who mixes the best? So if you have a marketing person and then you've got a technology co-founder, have a mixed team. So you have different ideas, but today it's critically important. Contacts and the connections 
and is in a way to the money. You got to have trust. If they know who you are, there's a whole lot better chance they're going to invest in you. And you bring up this, the regional diverse team as well. I think that's incredibly important. In the past that was looked at as a negative in some cases, yes. and now it's more important than ever because to your point, the best talent may not be right next door to you. The best talent may be somewhere else in the world. We're here on Zoom. We're all over the world, as I know, and our viewers will find out as they do a little research on us. And, and we're all here together. There's no reason those types of things can't happen. It's a little bit of an adjustment, um, nonetheless, in terms of time zones. But still, the best people for the best job is, is definitely something to pay attention I mean, to. Maya. Things oh. are the future, right? I mean, this is the future. The future is now. Either you buy into it, and use it and take this other medium or you stay in the physical world and you fail. Right. So what are you going well, to do? If you want to go global you're... today, right? You want yeah. to go global and you're in a Russia, you're in the Ukraine, you're in Nigeria. How do you do it? You have to have the connections, especially, mm -hmm. you know, Silicon Valley still today is a bastion of opportunity because 50% of the money is still located there. Right. Yep. And so it's a good place to for the port to the rest of the world. So if you have that, we focus on growth stage companies. Right. They start to the revenue. But if you've got that and you've got that opportunity to go to a port, have a team, part of your team located there. Mm -hmm. It's fantastic. Mm -hmm. My partner's in Moscow. Right. He's so he's American in Moscow. We broke our team up because of a lot of our, our startups are located there. So go have somebody located in that area. It's good to be decentralized these days. I know before it didn't used to be, but today it's a good thing. It is. It is. There's And there's so much more that can be done. And to your point, again, the talent, the resources, the knowledge, and going back to resources, the local resources versus, versus the global, that increased network. And again, increased knowledge is just so huge. And Maya, I want to come to you. I mean, same, same kind of question. What areas of opportunity, but anything else to add on Gary's point as well? Yeah, on as far as requiring talent on ground, um, there's a little bit of that. And, and I just want to reiterate the importance of particularly if you're investing in, in emerging markets, how necessary and essential it is to have team members on ground, because unlike, I mean, for a few reasons, um, as far as we want to make sure it's as democratized as possible, anyone from any background with zero connections to us can apply, can be funded. Um, you know, we that's why we accept applications on our online portal. We just want the best of the best companies. You don't have to have connections in order, in order to apply. Um, but as far as once we make that investment, our main offering is, is access to market through connections and introductions and, and, and access to later stage capital. And the unfortunate part of um, working in emerging markets where government systems, and et cetera, are still fairly nepotistic and also where there's low trust because of all the you know, um, historical corruption, et cetera, people really do deals, especially in the, in the high level corporate and, and government level with people that they know. And, and so uh, to reiterate that point of why it's important to have people on ground, um, um, just in and of, it's really hard to close a deal, especially in a, in a, in a more sort of offline, I'm not sure what, what Russia is like, but I'm not, I'm not sure how, you know, um, uh, how other places are, but on the continent, um, people still do business like memos, you know, they, somebody wants to update you on something, they type up a memo, they print it out, they sign it, they put their company stamp on it and they send it to you and unless you don't accept it unless it has the letterhead, like nonsense, uh, or whatever you want to call it. Um, so, so it's so essential to have people on the ground for, for that part. And secondly, because of how um, fast things move in the market, like macroeconomically micro, things change overnight. Like in Africa, in, in Nigeria specifically, the regulation changes rapidly. You can have a business that is scaling, you know, you know, you have 30% week over week, 100% week over, like crazy growth. And I've seen this from companies we were in the middle of diligence on. And all of a sudden there's overnight regulation change in the requirements of minimum balances for, for financial services companies. And it shut down half of the companies in the market or, um, you know, this, this ride hailing, you know, scooters, go, um, uh, motorcycle taxis type thing. That's really taken off on the continent in Lego state, you know, a city of 20 million people, one of the biggest, um, growth regions for these 
models that have been really picking up on the continent. As you guys mentioned, China Sequoia. China Sequoia invested over $100 million in Opay, which is in Nigeria, and it's a ride-hailing company um, and financial services are our business. Um, the businesses were, you know, essentially shut down from their main operations overnight because in one day you can do motorcycle taxis and the next day illegal. And mm -hmm. so um, just being on ground and having your ear to the ground and listening to what's happening in, in policy changes, having your relationships across the board so you can, you can get those updates. You know, we have unique risks here that people don't have um, anywhere else in the world. And so that's just to, to, just to reiterate in, in a, a, um, that point. And then uh, on, as far as what we're looking at, the type of businesses that we're looking at, um, on that note, um, so of course the pandemic and, and even just realizing how impactful regulation changes can be on the success of our business. And this even happens in, in the US. You know, I have a friend who has a, he had a home, uh, a home healthcare business where, where it was like Uber for home nurses. And there was a slight regulation change that literally shut down his business overnight. I think he raised about $60 million. They were scaling all across the US. They had employed, you know, tens of thousands of people, literally shut down the business overnight. Um, so, so just to be aware of those things. So, so one, in our diligence and what we look for, and what we sort of try to optimize and, and, and um, look out for is um, companies that have uh, excessive regulatory exposure. So the places we know that there are a lot of pieces moving in the, in the African market, with, specifically within financial services, we have to be very careful. It's the highest growth um, business space, and it has been for you know, the last decade on the continent, but also it's the most risky, namely because of that. Um, and, and mobility as well. And then as far as general, genu generally where we're looking, I'm, I'm assuming people have limited understanding of the African market. So just to provide a couple of high level facts that sort of explain why we do what we do. So there are 1.2 billion people on the continent. 70% of them are under the age of 35. So it's a very young population. Uh, there's about 93% mobile penetration. And that, um, that includes, um, uh, 650 million mo mobile users, which is more than the US and UK combined. So there are a lot of people who are tech enabled. There are a lot of people online and they're very young. It also has the um, fastest growing middle class in the world, um, which, um, which means that we're investing in companies now that are on the B2C side, uh, low, they might be lower margin, but they're significantly high volume because of how big the populations are. And the other side, so that's, that's on the one side on the B2C, the other side is um, a lot of businesses are fairly uh, not tech enabled in any capacity. And just bringing basic accounting software on our online, account, uh, online software or bake it basic marketplace software, anything that connects buyers and sellers, whether you have a trading platform, one of the companies we recently invested in was a financial services product that just connected um, buyers and sellers for uh, market access. And so just, just basic marketplace plays, things that bring transparency on either side um, um, and, and, and the like, and, and basic sort of business processes and accounting software. We also um, look at generally internet and connectivity devices. So things that allow um, the typical African consumer to go online. Um, MTN Nigeria was one of the most successful uh, VC, I guess, or tech investments in history. Um, they came here thinking they'd sell about 5,000 phone lines and now they're at about 150 million in Nigeria alone. Um, so anything in the telecommunications, internet, ISP, that space as well is what we're lo looking at. Um, and then lastly, energy and, and logistics, like port, shipment, uh, anything to digitize that process because it's so outdated, it's so archaic. Maya, I'll, I'll reach out directly. Uh, we have, uh, we do like Alliance of Angels, we do office hours and usually we have uh, companies from the uh, Pacific Northwest here, but uh, we just had a company from Nigeria in the phone space. So I definitely would love to get your feedback there as well. <laughs> Look at that to Gary's Happy point. To the new way of business. This is how we do things. So it's perfect. Got a good connection for you guys. Thank you, Maya. Eduardo, to you, same question, kind of what are you seeing as areas of opportunities? And as we get to this, you know, Roberto, get ready. We're about to come to your seg segment here in just a moment. But Eduardo, what are you seeing as areas of opportunity in terms of technologies or industries that uh, are really um, important going forward in the next six to 12? 
Yeah, definitely. I, I fully agree with uh, something that Gary mentioned. I mean, the uh, artificial intelligence sector is right now like uh, the form of electricity. I mean, basically, we have a tremendous interest in uh, all things related to artificial intelligence. Although we got to say that uh, after having, you know, analyzed a number of investments on a worldwide basis, uh, we got to say that uh, probably um, just one percent of uh, the the companies that they say uh, or that they try to be linked to artificial intelligence are actually uh, real artificial intelligence uh, technology companies. Because you know that um, as this is a hot topic, actually, uh, pretty much all the CEOs and founders try to say that they are uh, you know an artificial intelligence company. Well, they are not. So uh, this is why. Something that also um, the panel uh, have been discussing lately uh, regarding to people uh, takes more importance uh, than ever, actually. I mean, for example, we take uh, many, many, I will say, weeks in order to properly understand the uh, dynamics, not only of the industry and on market competition of uh, a particular company, but also the management team, which is behind the company. And what are the alignments of uh, that team with the company with the future of uh, the business because for us this is critical i mean we try to be smart money so uh when we invest in a company we want to be there for a long time so this is why also people is very very interesting so uh yeah i would say that pretty much artificial intelligence also uh internet and you know digitalization companies that kind of thing uh, are hot topics right now, actually, when it comes to, to investments and also esports and, and gaming, I would say, because uh, probably in this area of pandemics, uh, you know, people have been at home, uh, you know, trying to uh, spend some time with friends, meeting new people on a worldwide basis. So, uh, yeah, again, uh, a very, very interesting area uh, to invest. Absolutely. We didn't even get a chance to get into esports and gaming, which I know you love as a do I. And we've talked a little bit about here on VCTV, but we're going to pause right here. Guys, we're going to get to our next uh, segment of the show. And this part of the segment uh, or the show, excuse me, is exciting and thrilling. And after this, we've got even more to come. So right now, Roberto is going to get ready and Roberto is going to pitch his startup to us. This is something we do here on VCTV each week. We allow a few companies to come online and pitch us as investors and you, our audience. Roberto is the lucky uh, lucky chosen one today. So Roberto, you'll have five minutes to present your company, as I said uh, earlier before show, and hard five minutes, so we'll cut you off afterwards. Each of us as investors and judges today will give, us, give Roberto a little feedback on his company, his project uh, as well. And then afterwards, the next half of the show is very, very critical to your audience. This is where we're going to dive a little bit more deeper, a little bit more technical around our topic of fundraising. Where are the new vehicles? We're going to talk a little bit about this ICO, IEO, STO. Where are the new vehicles, the new fundraising opportunities that you can look at to start raising capital? For investors, we're going to dive a little bit more deeper in those opportunity areas to make sure you are prepared. And founders, back to you advice, how you can be successful for the next six to 12. It's going to be a tough road ahead, but there are ways to do it. And we're going to talk all about that in our second half of the show. So without further ado, judges, now uh, no longer investors, but judges, get your pen and paper ready. Roberto, go ahead and share your screen um, if you can, please. And as soon as you do, we'll go ahead and kick you off with five minutes. All right. So, Roberto, it's all you. Make sure you unmute yourself, and then uh, we are ready to go. Oh, Roberto, you're still muted. Make sure you do have yeah. that on mute. Now you are the listening. Loud and clear. Five minutes is yours. Go. Okay. Spot Cash One, the new era of fun engagement and fundraising is here. We reward your passion for sport and e-sport. What we offer? Customized fun engagement and fundraising platform powered by a social e-commerce gamification built on Scone's token. What's the problem we solve? Fun engagement. 
with, with low fund engagement comes empty seats in stadium. Fundraising, it's a constant struggle for clubs to find funds and sponsor. Our solution are tokenization and social e-commerce. A sport token issued by a club or league association will provide multiple benefits, like increasing funding, with the integration in a custom social e-commerce and the sponsorship crowdfunding system. Sport is sport market side validation. The overall sport market is expected to grow by 2023 at an annual growth of 18%. Ad spend will see an annual growth rate of 8%. Size of blockchain market 2020 is near 200 billion US dollar. Some of the best team in the world have a token, Juventus, Barcelona, Paris Saint-Germain, Roma, and other top teams. How we can help sport and the sport organization? Rise fund by selling your custom cryptocurrency to fans, athletes, brands, or traders. Engage more fans with a custom social e-commerce and gamification loyalty program with voting system. Manage all your custom data and stats. Take advantage of cheap and fast international transactions. Our products are Dex Exchange, Wallet, and Social e-commerce. The social platform integration with the DEX has made exchange and transfer of in-game cryptocurrency fast and easy for the world and gaming. The exchange and wallet are your gateway to the social e-commerce. The social e-commerce provides better level of presentation, privacy and engagement. Take full control of your data and stuff. The platform ever the world and gamification system powered by our Sconex coin. Fans and brands can even use it for voting or to make a donation and sponsorship. Club and organization, first step to goal. Create your club tokens with a dedicated economy. Sell tokens to your fans or partners and raise funds. Engage fans with a cryptocurrency reward gamification and voting system. Sell more products and advertising with your custom data and stats. Why invest in Spot Cash One? How we generate profit? Sconet branded product, club and athlete tokenization, loyalty program and data management, sell customized product, advertising revenue on our social platform, fees on transaction, commission on e commerce and sponsorship. The Spot Cash One social network with two month traction start. We have some of the best world athletes registered in our public platform before the release of our token. Five world champions, 200 athletes and brands registered, 25% weekly returning visitor, user and visitor from 120 countries. Our competitors, Socio, high cost transaction, no customization product. Spotify, not for fans, high cost commission, no customization. Centauro e-commerce, Low engagement with customers, no gamification. Spot Cash One offers a better customization and cheap transaction cost with a large ecosystem. This corner token run on Waves blockchain. Some use case for this corner token, main token for trading other sport token on eSport in our exchange. Reward for be active in the social e-commerce, gamification for fund engagement, crowdfunding and sponsorship. Voting for club and organization decision, sell item or service and ticket. We offer standard and customization product package. You can test some of our product already. We expected a growth rate of 100k athletes and club and much more funds for this year and partnership for tokenization with five major leagues and clubs. We have a professional international team of talents in the sport and blockchain area with more than 20 years of experience. Our expansion plan starts from Brazil, where our company is registered, but we have already at least club and visitor from 120 countries. We plan to move a branch of our company in Europe and Asia in the future. Thanks for listening. I'm Roberto Moretto, CEO of SportCash One. Roberto, thank you so much. And by the way, we were talking offline. Five minutes was going to be tight. You hit it right on the dot. So congratulations. You didn't thank have you. any problem. Good job. Uh, so thank you very much to our uh, to our judges, um, guys. I want to make sure Roberto gets a little bit of feedback. So I'm going to come down, come around to each of you, see if you guys have any comments or questions. Again, Roberto, thank you uh, as well for your presentation today, Eduardo. Let's start with you. This is an area that you know very much about being in blockchain, but also in gaming and esports. Uh, any feedback or comments back to Roberto on his pitch? 
Yeah, exactly. I mean, first of all, Robert, uh, Roberto, thanks for, for the pitch. Actually, I believe that the uh, presentation is, uh, you know, looks cool, actually. In my particular opinion, maybe a little bit dense uh, at some point uh, at certain slides, actually, but in your terms, I think it's a good presentation, actually. And when it comes to the business proposition, actually, um, I fully agree with uh, with Kali. I mean, definitely gaming, sports, and, and all, everything linked to, to ICOs and gamification is uh, a very hot topic, actually. Right now, investors are looking to, uh, you know, invest on a very safe way in these kind of businesses uh, that have been booming lately, uh, particularly those related to social media, because, you know, people tend to use also gaming to meet other, uh, you know, um, uh, players around the world, actually. And uh, subscription services are also booming, such as PS Now also, Xbox uh, Live Pass. And I definitely believe that these kind of uh, companies such as yours will uh, help uh, boost uh, particularly, you know, let's say indies and, and studios which are not uh, big names and that they're looking for financing actually and they're having problems uh, because of these subscription services or large, uh, you know, e-gaming and e-sports companies. Also for teams, uh, for example, in Spain, we have a number of teams that have been actively uh, raising money in order to uh, become uh, significant uh, names in, in the e-gaming uh, industry uh, on a worldwide basis. So, uh, yeah, definitely I believe that uh, there's a strong uh, potential and, and something that uh, we will uh, definitely look into it. So, congrats. Thank you. Awesome. And, and to Eduardo's point, Roberto, it takes a lot to get up on stage, whether it's virtual or real, and share what you've built and your passion. So again, congratulations, and thank you for taking that time. Mark, to you, sir, this is, again, something of area of expertise being in the blockchain space. Any comments or feedback uh, for Roberto? No, definitely. So first of all, Roberto, thank you very much for the presentation. I say it's, uh, it's, it's always a challenge, especially in this virtual world. How do you make sure you're actually connecting with the audience and uh, bringing your story across? So getting it down to five minutes, it's a big achievement. So congratulations. Uh, second, um, the whole gaming, esports, in a distributed and in a distributed environment, there's definitely uh, opportunity there. So there's uh, people love sports. Why do they subscribe to cable TV? We just had a report again. It's like with the drop in live sports, cable TV numbers are going down. Um, so people are missing their sports. A question, of course, I would love to see, having said that, uh, there are a couple of questions I would love to see addressed in the pitch. Um, one is um, you can't talk about sports without mentioning COVID. So what is going to happen without live sports? What's the focus on esports? So you're really having a Having a clear story and addressing it up front, I think, will help people to engage and see where 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 this could go. Um, there might even be an opportunity, I think, with, with your global presence and looking into hyper local. So, um, what's happening in different countries? I mean, there's the global sport, of course, but there might be something on the local level as well. I would just look into that. Um, then, what I was missing is uh, more about the competition because I think you're not the you're not the only company in that space. So there's definitely things out there and competition is not a bad thing. It just means other people see that there is a business opportunity, but uh, how do you position yourself? Have you looked at them? So just giving me as an investor confidence that you are super well aware of which space you're going in, who are the other players in there and how you're going to attack it and, and playing a successful role in there. Um, last but not least, I think um, a little bit or two things actually more. Two more things. One is um, a little bit more on predictions and numbers. So what's the revenue numbers? What's in it for me as an investor? I mean, at the end of the day, I don't really care where I put my money. I want to make sure I get it back and I get it multiplied. So um, what's the story for me here? Um, so I really need to hear more about this. And then just um, the last area is really about compliance. Um, you are, I said, you're registered in Brazil. There's a lot of other countries out there you're active in. What about the US? What about, I don't know, Malta, whatever. Um, how do you make sure you're compliant with anti-money laundering, know your customer rule, but also the gambling rules that potentially come in play there. So again, it's all hard to cover this in five minutes, but what I as investor want to see is that you have thought about it. And then I can, in due diligence and, and further conversation, I can drill down into those areas. But giving me a well-rounded picture that you have looked at all of those areas will really help. 
Absolutely. Monts to you. Same thing. Any, any comments or feedback for Roberto and Roberto, thank, thank you for listening. I know we're just throwing stuff at you, so you haven't had a chance to respond, but do take, do appreciate all the great res- uh, feedback you're getting. This is, this is gold in, in some cases. So Monts continue. Uh, first things first, it's definitely very difficult to cover everything in five minutes. So uh, thank you Roberto for the presentation. Uh, I definitely do not have as much expertise in blockchain um, as other members, so I'll be extremely respectful and you know keep my feedback very specific in terms of whatever little I understand. Uh, uh, you know, do try to cover more in terms of the team, the capabilities, the networks, and how you're going to take on the competition, and you know what what makes your team win against others. If you're able to you know get that across uh, in your first impression or your first few impressions with the investor, uh, you have a better chance at succeeding. So I wish you the best. Uh, I'm not going to take up much of your time. Like I said, I leave it to the other panel members. Thank you. Gary. Thank you, Mons. Gary. Yeah. So one of the things that you want to do when you're online is you want to change the tone of your voice. It's very, very important to do that to capture people's attention. So the other thing is a wow statement. What is going to captivate them, enrich them, and grab their soul? So you need a statement like that. So, and I know I, I, I do presentations in Russian and in Russian, I have to practice and practice and practice because of my intonations. The other thing is your revenue numbers. I mean, I, don't, I forget who said it, but revenue numbers are critically uh, important and you've got to focus on that because oh, Mark said it. So if you look at it, how in the world are you going to get a payback and over what period of time? Where, what's it going to look like, right? And do you have any revenue today? Is there any revenue now? Is it early stage company? What stage are you in? Roberto, that's a question for you. Yeah, Roberto, do you have revenue? So, I, okay. No, at this moment, we don't have a revenue. I mean, but those are the kind of things you want to say up front. We're an early stage company. But we think we're going to dominate this space. And the reason why is because we have the best team on the planet Earth that can do it. We right? offer that. Um, yeah, for sure. I mean, that's, that's what you got to do. I ran an accelerator, one of the largest, actually the largest private accelerator in the world. I started it. So I can tell you directly having to go through this, you know, and there's lots of things we can talk about. But those are the kind of things that are important because they're going to bet on you, right? Early stage startups, the thing they want to do is they're going to bet on you and trust you. So you got to come out as why am I the best person to be able to get this thing done? And why is it, I mean, there's other questions with GDPR and compliance and personal data protection, et cetera. Those are other issues. The other thing you want to think about, your advisory board. I don't know. I didn't see it. Did I miss a slide? Do you have an advisory board? Yes, we have one from USA. Greg is a is an old guy from USA working for Mars with one years and a half, something like that. Remember, a, I, I call it the Keep It Simple Stupid program, right? Let me tell you how I work, because I'm just a country. We have a one, one two time Olympic that is with us, Brenda Riley. He's been two time in the Olympic Games, competing with Great Britain. He's a, and uh, I mean, uh, representing the International Surfing Association, that is government for this for the surf and stand up public. Well, but Roberto, so, uh, you gotta, Roberto, you got to talk about those things, right? The other yeah. thing, listen, when you're building an advisory board, I'm going to call it the rule of threes. It's very, very simple. What kind of issues have already come up in this phone call? That is security and privacy. So one of the things that I would strongly suggest, so. What I do is Rick Orloff, who's a former chief security officer at Apple, I put him on the board of my companies, right? Because it's going to come up, security and privacy. And if you got one of the best guys in the world, second, or ladies in the world, second, what else comes up? The other question is access to capital. So what I do, because we're in the States, although it works a lot around the world, you find somebody from that's graduated from Stanford and in the VC community, like Bill Reichert or Guy Kawasaki, somebody like that that's really well known, I put Bill on my company, right? And then you wanna find the rule of threes, somebody that's had an exit. So just like you said about somebody in gaming that's in the space, that's had an exit or pretty well known that can actually advise you and help you. Just, these are like the simple steps to do it. 
So I think you've got, you know, it sounds, I'm not an e-gaming guy, uh, but I can tell you how to build a company. And I think you've got, you know, if you focus on that, you want to make the everybody feel comfortable. And especially when you're online like this, and they may not be able to meet you to get, how much are you raising? By the way, I don't know. Did I miss it? Yeah, that's me and Mutu. Yeah, when I was thinking about the revenue and the raising. Yeah, how much, how we much, have money, are you, how much money are you raising? Yeah, until now we have built all of our product. We have a solid, uh, we have already uh, athletes, professional on board, world champions, but we have no raising money. We have not selling tokens. That's so okay. We have I mean, built, the thing is, Roberto, you got to yeah. say, okay, well, you haven't raised money, but how much are you raising? How much do you want to raise? How much we want to raise? Uh, yeah. This uh, depends uh, when we will start to, to raise money. In this moment, we start. We have just approached from a venture firm that we will probably next week. Oh, but uh, how much are you going to raise? Yeah, we are looking for near two million. Okay, but so the, to, to Gary's like point, to that to the, listen, listen. When we're on the phone or on Zoom like this, you got to have direct answers, right? Because you don't have an ask. I mean, if I wanted to invest it in, I wouldn't invest because you don't even. I don't even know what you want. Right. So to, to summarize real quick, Roberto, get, thank you, Gary. Gary's making some great points. Maya, I'm coming to you next. To summarize, the, one of the things that you, you want to be mindful of is that story you're telling and making sure to get out the information that investors want to hear, right? Revenues, the team, including your advisors, how much you're raising, the ask. These are the types of things you want to make sure are part of that. And going back to the tone is you're telling a story. Right, you're not. It's not a sales pitch. One, two, four. It's it, you're telling a very flowing story. We want to make sure we understand the whole picture and all of the pieces that we can then dive further into. And also, we want to feel your passion for this because if you're not passionate, it's something that you're not going to be doing in six months. So we want to feel that. So from a sports perspective, tell us. And I'm going to use Eduardo as the example. You know that you you were a gamer for 10 years and you love sports. And as a fan, you just wish you could have more engagement. And because of that, you decided with your team to build this new product. So get into that story and not so much just reading from the slides and also give those two new type of metrics that Gary mentioned. But again, it's a big process. It takes a lot of guts to get up here and do this live. You're doing a great, great job. This is just good feedback for your next pitch to just rock it out, close that check and just make life happen. So Maya, to you, any other feedback or comments to Roberto? Because we, 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 we beat you up a little bit, but it's all for good, good feedback. Trust me. Yeah, yeah. So first of all, it, 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 was a, it was a very interesting pitch. Um, I know nothing about this space, so I'm a little lost. I'm going to be honest with you, but, um, but, uh, but great job. So firstly, before any feedback, um, um, great job. Um, and, and to, to reiterate, so I don't have a whole lot of new things to comment on, but I uh, just want to provide a little bit of clarity. So one, the reason for asking about the revenue is because somebody, well, I, well, the reason I'll get, I'll, I'll leave this to me. I want to understand your product market fit and whether consumers are willing to pay for whatever it is. That's a really good demonstration of product market fit, as in people actually want what you're building. And so revenue is one way to, anal to assess for that, as in recurring sales, um, people you know, engaging with the platform. But the other way is users. So if, even if you don't necessarily have revenue right now, how many users do you have? And actually, that's a real question. How many users do you have on the platform, assuming you have launched? If not, that's one thing too. You can say, you know, we're pre-launch, et cetera, et cetera. But if you've launched, how many people are on the platform and what is the retention? So somebody comes on once and then they never use it again, or this is something where they come on your platform and they want to use it every day. So what is what is the like MAU, the DAU, like write down these words because you'll you'll definitely... These, especially building a, a, a B2C, a, a, a company that um, is online and gaming, you're, you're, the, key, the key metrics that you will care about more than anything else will be MAU, DAU. So you want to know your monthly active users, your daily active users, your weekly active users, your retention, and your churn. So like churn is like how quickly do, pe how many, how, how, how quickly do people just fall off the, the, the platform and stop using it? 
You know, what's the LTV? What's the lifetime value of, of the users on your platform? These are all things you really should have in your back pocket. And there should have been, there, I would like to see for somebody who's building a gaming product, I need to see those front and center because the core of success of gaming is your ability to get in the minds of your users and build something that's so addictive and so engaging that they're always going to want to use it. So just to explain that revenue and what, what, what's the point of it, that's part of it. But the other reason that that we're all, I think, or that I am asking about revenue is because I also want to understand the sustainability of your business model. So is this something that it costs you, you know, between cloud hosting and developers building and whatever marketing expenses, it's it costs you, you know, a hundred dollars versus you're only making a dollar in revenue, and and that's sort of this the the long term uh, projections of the business. Obviously, you know, I'm just using simple numbers, but I want to understand the viability of your business model especially because we're in pandemic times. So now anticipate that fundraising is going to be, you know, twice as hard, if not like, you know, a few a, a few single numbers higher than that to raise money now. So if you were only to get my check and you got, say, you know, I invested 200, 400, that's our average ticket size between 200 and 400,000, and you didn't get your two, 2 million, would you be able to sustainably run? If, yeah, if yes, why? Well, if you if your business model makes sense, if you're generating revenue, your economics work, cash flow, you know, you'll be cash flow positive in in 12 months, in 24 months. I want to understand your runway, how long you have. And so when you're it sounded like you hadn't exactly figured out um, why or exactly how much you want to raise. I would first build out a financial model. It doesn't have to be fancy at, at all, but just a financial model that has all of your your expenses and all of the anticipated expenses. and then. Um, also as you're growing, however, those expenses grow and then, and then whatever, and you want to raise for about 18 to 24 months of runway. So when you're asking for an amount, it should last you given all the expenses and the growth, you know, you know uh, optimizing for growth and, and, and that's that cash flow, even if you do or do not start generating, I need to know that whatever you're asking for is going to last you probably two years, especially in the time period that we're in and when we have such an, uh, an unstable and unpredictable market. So that's just to answer that question. So next time you come, please be able to answer, I'm asking for this much money. It's going to go to these things. It's going to last me this, this long. Um, and then also the competitive edge. I don't, I don't understand the, the economics or the, the, the nuts and bolts of this business in this space, but I really, I, I, I needed a little bit more hype. You, you had, there was a lot of humility and uh, humility in your pitch, which is great. Feel free to brag about yourself. Like, why are you the greatest person to be building this solution? I want to know, why are you the boss? Why is your team the dopest team? You know, why are you going to blow everyone else all the, out of the water? Have, you know, you can say these things. Um, obviously, nothing fictitious or embellished, but I'm, I'm sure that the truth of, of your exact re resume has something promising in it. So feel free to brag a little bit more. Um, and then, and then the second to last one is regulatory. So I'll bring that up again. I don't understand. All I know is that there's been a lot of regulations coming around around blockchain and, and, and digital currency. So why are you not going to be regulated? And what sort of licenses do you have in place globally and within your, key, within your core market that's going to um, save you from that or that's going to pre prevent you from getting in trouble? And then the last thing is the 30-20-10 rule. So 10 slides. Um, 20 words on a page or less and 30 point, 30 point font. So um, Eduardo, the guy who knows crypto, he knows this space at first talked about or mentioned that it was a little dense. He, he knows what he's doing. For those who have no idea about this space at all, it seems even more uh, uh, over our heads. So for me, if you can keep it really simple, and use fewer words. And there's two decks you have. One, once you have venture capitalist interest and once people are very engaged, that one can be super comprehensive and have all your details. But the one when you have a five minute pitch and you're just shopping, keep it simple, keep it high level and, and keep it just, just quite basic. And, but overall it was, it was great. And um, if you incorporate that stuff, I'm sure that you'll be on the right path. Thank you. And to Maya, yeah, to Maya's point to general audience. So you may not know who you're going into. You may not know all of their backgrounds. So Maya brings up a good point. She may not have the background in gaming, but she understands business. That's what she does. She invests in companies. So she understands what makes a good company. But someone like Eduardo knows more about 
gaming, he's going to ask for more details around those types of things. But anyways, you know, I, I again, I want to give you a big round of applause, a little golf clap here, because you did a great job, Roberto, getting up and sharing this with us. I know we gave you a ton of advice, and I hope you take that, refine the pitch, and come back along with go out and talk to uh, more investors, uh, and we wish you the greatest success. But like we do here on every uh, on every episode of VCTV, we want to make sure you get a chance to shout out. So what's the website that everyone can go to to find you online um, as uh, as we close your section out here? Yeah, just enter in spotcash1.1, uh, one, and you can follow us. And there you will, you will find more information about our, our team of uh, nine people at this moment and uh, test our product, our exchange, our social network, our wallet, and see what we have built until now. We are ready for the market. We have already a public product on the market with uh, many good athlete, professional athletes. Wonderful. So everyone definitely check out Eduardo's pro- or Roberto's product. Apologies, Eduardo. Roberto's project. Do check it out. Roberto, thank you. We're going to go back now to, to our investors. Guys, it's the second half of the show. It's lightning round time. As we're coming to close here on the show today, I've got a few questions I want to get out that will give our audience even further advice. So Roberto, if you can go on mute, please, so we don't have any echo there. Uh, now, investors, here's the deal. So the first question, I want to get back to ICOs, STOs, IEOs, I something O's. You know, we've talked a lot about venture capital today, but let's talk a little bit about these future fundraising vehicles, right? There's been venture debt, there's bridge rounds, there's all these different stages that we've looked at and talked about on previous episodes. Mark, Eduardo, coming to you two first. STO, IT, IEO, ICO, whatever it's being called going forward. Is this a new opportunity for investment capital. You two are experts in this. I want to come to you first. So Eduardo, let's start with you, Mark. I'll come to you afterwards. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we have seen a a tremendous increase in the number of investors and particularly from Asia, by the way, uh, when it comes to uh, investing in ICOs and STOs. Um, We actually are in the middle of two uh, of those, uh, you know, new... um, um, the vehicle, investment vehicles. I mean, we are in the middle of an ICO for a company that operates within the uh, technology um, sector and particularly within the global hospitality and experiences sector, actually. And we are, uh, we have also launched our own uh, cryptocurrency. And also we are in the middle of an STO for an industrial business, which is going to be also quite innovative uh, when it comes to, you know, to, to typical STOs. And we are going to launch this one in the U.S. and also in Europe. So, uh, I mean, right now, it's, it's probably not the best time of uh, the last, uh, I would say, couple of years um, in order to, to raise capital through these kind of vehicles. But actually, I mean, right now, when it comes to uh, proper, you know, straight equity issues uh, on, or bond issues, actually, uh, in order to, to raise money. Um, uh, we definitely believe and we are very optimistic for the future uh, with these kind of uh, alternative uh, ways of financing. Definitely a lot of interest, uh, particularly from Asia, also in the US starting to um, uh, raise uh, much more money through these kind of uh, vehicles. In Europe still lack, uh, they, they fall behind a little bit when it comes to, to raise money because you know they tend to be more conservative. Uh, but but definitely, I mean, we believe that uh, this will uh, continue increasing um, over the next years. I will say definitely. Mark, to you, same question: STOs, IEOs, ICOs. Is this still a viable option of fundraising? Blah blah blah. blah whatever. Yes. No. Exactly. So, <laughs> POs. So, yes. Whatever. So. Um, The short answer is I think having financial instruments that give far more people access to investment vehicles, democratizing investment opportunities in general is a good thing. And we can see it with like Robin Hood and the traditional stock market, people are going in there. Um, If they make smart decisions or not smart decisions, that's a different different topic. But again, being able to um, participate in a global decentralized financial markets, I think that's a good thing. So having said that, 
um, the foundations of investments are not changing. And unfortunately, a lot of people, um, they just write, they say, don't do their homework. Um, when I started angel investment, I asked an experienced investor next to me and said, so how long do you do this? And he said, 10 years. I said, okay, what did you learn in those 10 years to predict the success of a project or a company? He said, well, when I started, I thought that the, the, the success is determined 20% idea, 80% team. And now 10 years later, I think it's 2% idea and 98% team. So, and every time I, over the 10 years, I ignored that advice, I lost money. So, <laughs> so it's really about making sure you have the right people in place. You do background checks, you know, see what the network looks like, what the advisors are, how willing they are to learn. So you're making sure you have the right team in place. Um, in the crypto in the crypto space itself, though, what happened is, as a traditional investor, what you do is you see a lot of well-meaning teams that are not capable of pulling it off for one or the other uh, reason. What happened since 2017, 18, is in addition to the well-meaning but incapable teams, you see a huge amount of scammers. It's just, it's, it has been, as I said, in, unbelievable. Um, the bar of quality of pitches of being investable in the blockchain space um, is very, very poor. What you hear is, is, most of this is insulting to be blunt. So we are really looking for good companies. We love good teams. We want to invest, but it really needs to make sure that um, the bar is at least as good as in all the other industries of what we are seeing. Right team, right investors, right, right advisors, right infrastructure, getting the basics right, understanding how a business works. So all of those things need to be there. And then I think uh, we can talk about the idea and the valuations and all kinds of other things. But there's really a lot in our blockchain industry. There's still a lot of to go versus other industries. Absolutely. All right. Next up, Maya. Uh, quick, quick insights and, and advice for companies uh, that are looking to uh, enter the market in Africa or investors as well. So kind of a two-sided question. If founders looking to enter and expand into the African market or if investors are looking to uh, start investing in the, the emerging markets throughout Africa, what advice do you have on both sides? Firstly, I would say you can never enter the African market because it's 54 countries and it's really big and it's all different cultures and all different regulations. And like a lot of times people are like, oh, Africa is like North America or it's like, you know, like, like, uh, you know, Central Europe or it's like, you know, these places. But, you know, Nigeria, we have Nigeria here. I explained the, the wildness with the regular regulate regulation. There's been a what 30 percent devaluation in local currency in the last few months. Um, there's a 200 million population with a, a 20 million people in the city. Lagos N next door is Ghana. There's like barely over a million people in the key city. Um, it, it was just nominated as the strongest currency next to U.S. dollar uh, this year. Um, and it has incredibly stable regulation and is an incredibly safe place to be. Um, next to us, you know, a little bit, a little bit further is Cote d'Ivoire, Francophone Africa, you know, and, and Senegal. And it's totally different language, different lifestyle, the consumer preferences. It's, it's totally not as digi digitized, tech enabled as, as, um, as, as Anglophone as far as West Africa. So, so one, I would say, um, be wary of the Africa approach because it'll, you'll sink and, and fail, period. Um, um, one, um, as somebody who's, if you're not African, you don't have core uh, connections and an, and, an, and an office here, um, I would say um, for, for people looking to expand their business into the African market, one, find um, a very well diligent, somebody you know well, not somebody who you emailed who's like, yeah, you know, pay me this and we can st set up a JV and all, you know, just send me your products and I'll distribute them. No, 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 no. Uh, it's still like, still use, still use your sense. Um, do your research diligence come on ground so you can understand the market dynamics it, itself. And so when, you know, you launch your business and somebody says, uh, I can't 
I can't send out any any uh, foreign currency. You'll be like, oh, this person's trying to scam me. But if you're in, in the actual market, you'll understand why and what happens or or any of the other things. Oh, the product's been sitting at port for three months. And they're not lying. These things actually happen. You need to understand why and have the connections to resolve them. So one, come on ground and visit the place where you want to launch. Two, never launch without a local JV, somebody on ground because of the things that I that I had talked about before. And three, make sure it's not just a general partnership with, with another, a competitive business. Make sure it's deeply, fundamentally um, symbiotic, as in they have absolute incentive to promote your business just as much as their own. Anything other than that is, is going to fail in the market. Africa is already, you know, across the continent, we are already dealing with so many infrastructural, so many things tar uh, that, that, that could be that could cause business to go haywire already to have the burden of somebody else's bottom line. That's not aligned with what I have to focus in on, on my day to day. I'm going to forget what, whatever you're doing. Um, so that's as far as on the business side, make sure it's a strategic partnership and you understand the fundamentals of the other person's business that you're partnering with on ground. And it's deeply inherently symbiotic. Um, as far as on the investor side, uh, for investors looking into the market, again, Co-invest. Our investment firm, it, how it's structured is I mentioned before, 80% of our limited partners run later stage global firms. They use us to source deals uh, and then are able to maintain our pro rata in, in, later, in later stage rounds when they want to take over these deals. Find local partners on ground who understand the market dynamics, who understand the Africa context, who can get the founder out of those local problems because there will be, I promise you, I promise you. Um, and, and then you can focus on the big ticket transactions, the getting potentially international ac uh, acquirers, et cetera, et cetera. So it's, it's necessary to have both local capital, capital, typically smaller tickets, as well as those, those international investors on ground. Um, every year for the, since 2016, Africa has doubled the amount of foreign or uh, the amount of venture capital dollars that came into the African market. We, last year we were at about 2 billion this year. Uh, I don't even know what's going on with COVID, but uh, to, to that, that said, a lot of international firms are starting to invest. Uh, y Combinator has well over 20 deals they've done, 500 startups, Techstars, Graycroft, uh, Social Capital, WTI, um, even Andreessen Horowitz did Branch in, 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 in East Africa. So a lot of these guys are strategically co-investing, but they have local partners. They do their own diligence. They come here, work with local partners. That's all I got to say. Enough said. Uh Maya is the person to call at any any points of this. That's the, I think the summary there. But great points, Maya. Mons to you. Same question, but for India, quickly. How? What advice do you have for companies looking to enter the Indian market? As it is very large, 1.3 almost 1.35 billion people right now, just behind Asia or excuse me, China at 1.43 billion. Great opportunity, but a lot happening. So, what advice do you have for founders looking to enter the market? So it, it boils down to who your customers are. So 1.3 billion, it's great if your business, uh, you know, and the business model works around MAU, uh, monthly active users, daily active users, you know, it's, uh, it totally depends on the business model as to how you're really going to make money at the end of the day, right? So if it's MAUs and DUs you're looking at, then obviously you can, you know, go by the numbers in terms of, you know, 1.3 billion people, huge opportunity. Uh, there's a smartphone revolution, which has happened. We skipped the landlines. Uh, just Geo itself, uh, you know, which raised, uh, you know, $15.5 billion plus uh, in the past few months, it has a user base of 400 million users. And actively, I think, you know, we, we would be looking at something like 900 million users, uh, say, within, uh, by, by, the, by 2021. That's, I'm, I'm hoping these stats are right. By 2021, we should be having 100 million users. So if your business is looking at them in terms of not actively making purchases, but, you know, you're looking at them as, you know, active users of your product, and then you try to monetize via some other mechanism, great market. But if you're looking at, say, uh, a service, which is, again, looking at, you know, very specifically, uh, someone who's going to make in-app purchases, say, uh, you have some other me mechanisms kicking in, then your, uh, you know, your user or target uh, base shrinks down to almost 3 to 5%, or it might be even 3 to 4% of the entire 1.3 billion population, which is there. So uh, any business which comes in, you have to be very cognizant, you know, what the business model is, you know, how you're going to go about it. Uh, I'll, I'll share the same points as Maya that, you know, you have to be very, very specific in terms of, you know, how you're really going to, what's your go-to-market strategy? How are you really going to, you know, uh, 
work with uh, you know the different states over there so it, it's the same case over here in india uh, we have a lot of different states how are you going to you know uh, tap into the culture how are you able to you know uh, tap into the user base are you going by demographics are you going by state by state so uh, everything uh, you know you can have a broader vision but you know definitely you'll have to do the grind in terms of you know sitting down and planning out how you're really going to uh, you know make use of that market out there uh, so that's for the businesses for investors i think it's a huge market because you know if you look at uh, anything which happens right now there's a lag which is happening so if you look at say uh, uh, if you look at venture capital 70s 80s it was there in the us uh, 90s it started in india so we have some sort of you know things kicking in uh, after a lag uh, and at one point in time all the technologies will percolate all the places so as an investor even if it's a tough time right now if it's covid or whatever it is you do know that you know there are some things which you want to see in the world out there it could be augmented reality virtual reality ai uh, you know any of the technologies which you know for sure are definitely going to be there uh, and any of the smart investors would be looking at you know partnering with you know the best guys in those uh, in the different ecosystems to see you know how can you get a share of the market over there uh in terms of you know just specifically talking about ai if you look at you know just uh the sample data sets uh, where you are trying to you know uh get uh you know cut, cut, get out the you know bias in the uh, algorithms uh you know india is a super diverse place to you know really go after ai in terms of healthcare in terms of you know other things uh and if you can really tap into the market and you know work with the right kind of players you do have a chance to you know really build an ai Uh, which cuts across you know data a sample uh, data bias and you build something which works for a larger population uh, in the world out there uh, you basically base you know uh, taking sample data sets for you know just specific populations so that's one added advantage and uh, any mm-hmm. investor there are limitations in terms of you know funds uh, you know uh, the fund life you know 10 years 11 years 12 years uh, some of mm-hmm. the investors someone like leafixel is now looking at 15 years and in india it is a tough market you will need to you know see how you can you know work around uh, and have more patience and you know really go down after uh, the players who are going to you know really uh, you know just grind it out and you know win uh, you need to find out people who are not in it for you know uh, just the money part of it they are willing to take a few hits and you know they can keep going and and, and invest is- locally as well. So I apologize Monty, I got I got to I got to keep going. So you got great points. There's a lot more we're going to talk about. We're going to welcome you back to talk about India and investing uh directly there on a, on another show, but it's 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 again to Maya's point, local. Go local, invest local, spend time locally. If you don't, you're doing yourself, your company and your investors a disservice. Gary, last question to you before we come to closing thoughts quickly. someone wants to get into artificial intelligence they want to build they want to invest what's the one piece of advice you give them to get started give me a phone call <laughs> done that's the man or reach out to him on linkedin yeah, he is 100% LinkedIn, in bill uh gsd i'm happy to talk about it but i'm happy it's a deeper discussion than just you know one thing it is it is and i apologize we don't have time to go into it today but again vc tv we did two episodes Yesterday and the day before with Gary about artificial intelligence and deep technologies we go super technical into that so definitely tune in investors. Thank you so much for your time today. I want to make sure everyone gets a quick closing thought in on any advice you have for founders as they are fundraising over the next 6 to 12 months and then where can everyone find you online. So Eduardo, let's start with you. Advice for founders over the next 6 to 12 and where can everyone find you online? Yeah, first of all, I would like to to say a big thank you uh to all the talking team, also to all the panelists, Kylie, Elena, also for a tremendous job again. Um and, and very, very pleased to be here actually. Yeah, I mean, my recommendation for founders is that uh they have to be, you know, aware that the current situation is probably not the best uh in order to raise money, but that whoever we are very optimistic uh for the next month. So, uh definitely uh there are tons of projects good projects that will be uh properly funded over the next uh months and uh yeah i mean uh, you can find me online also on on linkedin so uh yes uh um yes uh, write my name and and you will find me definitely so uh very pleased to be here and and hopeful to see you again uh soon absolutely mons where can everyone find you and any closing uh, piece of advice you have for the audience 
Sure thing. Uh, thank you, Kyle. First things first. Uh, thank you and shout out to the entire Litokin team. It's incredible to be here. Shout out to all the panelists. I learned a fair bit today and I look forward to stay in touch. Uh, in terms of uh, coming to the founders, the next six to 12 months, look at it as an opportunity. I mean, like, you know, because of COVID, you have the opportunity to really, you know, get some incredible talent across the world. Uh, I don't know whether it's going to be in the founding team or otherwise, but uh, you can, everyone is, you know, looking to, you know, really uh, make a couple of things happen. And, you know, there might be pivots, there might be uh, even opportunities which might be shutting down. So people would be looking to switch. So if you can find great talent and, you know, uh, motivate them to join your teams, that's something which can work for you. Uh, and you can definitely get some great talent out there. Uh, just trying to put a positive spin on what's ha happening and what will happen over the next uh, one to two years. And uh, that's it. I mean, like, you know, you have one life, just make it count. I love it. Absolutely. Maya, to you, closing thoughts on advice and then where can everyone find you online? Yeah. Uh, first, I'll start with the latter. Um, everyone can find me online or people can find the fund if you want to apply and you have to be an African and uh, Africa based investor targeting the African market at www.ingressive, I N G R E S S I V E, capital.com www.ingressivecapital.com. Um, you can also reach out to me. I'm not that great with email, to be honest. I'm much better with Instagram. Um, so you can reach me at Mayanator, M-A-Y-A-N-A-T-O-R, Mayanator. And I respond to 100% of my DMs, no matter what you write. Don't send me novels. I don't really like those. I'll still respond to you, but please just don't send me novels. Um, as far as my advice for founders, um, as I say, so we just closed $10 million and I say this um, a lot. I started my VC fund because no firm would hire me as an analyst. And I was like, hey, I know how to source deals and I have connections. Like I wanna work for your firm. And people were like, uh, you know, you're really good at hosting dinner parties. Maybe you should like be an event planner. Or like, oh, I don't think you'd really catch the finance thing. Or like, you know, all these sort of whatever biases that people have. And so I was like, you know what? I could probably raise my own fund. And then I did. And so I just want everyone to remember and recognize the fact that um, no matter who you are and where your background is, and if, and if there's nobody who looks like you in the industry where you're building, and there's even nobody in the industry you're building, period, it doesn't matter. And you can pioneer that space and build, build your character and build your story into the narrative. So whoever you are, wherever you're from, get started. Damn right. Mark. To you, oh, you got to follow great. that up because that I should have uh, closed with that. Maya, I apologize. Yeah. I should have had you be in the close. So, so Mark, Gary, you got a lot to live up to. Go well, for I'm it. Not, I don't want to step on anybody's toes, but Maya definitely rocked it today. So, uh, I and it was very inspirational. Just I have three daughters, so it's very inspirational to listen to to listen to you and see this. Um, <laughs> Thank you. Very, very, very nice. <laughs> um, how, so how can people follow me um, on Twitter, Mark M. Eberstein. So like Mark Müller Eberstein, Mark M. Eberstein. I'll put in the Twitter. show notes for everybody too. Don't worry, so I'll put in the show notes. Find. Um, best way to follow and to stay in touch for sure for, for the broader audiences. Um, I would highly recommend to all the entrepreneurs to leverage the free resources and guidance that is out there for startups. There's so much information. I mean, our Alliance of Angels, the American Capital, uh, Angel Capital Association, there's so much tech crunch, um, good advice on how to do pitch decks, how to structure things. Um, there's really no excuse for not being well prepared before you get into, uh, before you get to talk to investors, because it's all there. I mean, there's sample decks for people that have, that have done this. Um, so at least getting the basics right should not be uh, an insurmountable hurdle for, for entrepreneurs today. And yes, we are living in a very changing world. On one side, it's the opportunity to talk to global audiences, global customer audience, global investor audiences. Um, and I think as Maya said, and uh, um, I think uh, Gary mentioned it as well, and Monsi, um, be aware of the details of the projects you're looking at. And it's local, it's knowledge, it's network um, and, and relationships and making sure you have all of those things nailed down. And um, it's, a, it's an exciting world I think we're living in, has always been, and it's going to be um, a very transformational two, three years in front of us. Absolutely, Gary. 
close us out. Yeah, so, you know, I, I've been through this many times, 15 times. When I did my first company at 21 years old, people said you couldn't do it. I just came out of graduate school. I didn't have any credit. And I did $9 million in sales in less than two years. And I didn't have a clue what I was doing. It was interest rates were through the roof. People said it would never work because it was a project building houses and they said it couldn't be done. And I said, you know, I'm going to do it differently. And it worked with click software. As I said, I mean, they said we were going to go out of business. It was com company coming out of Israel. Nobody was really doing things with Israel at the time came to the U S we rocked it, sold for over a billion dollars. When I first went to Russia, I lived in Russia on and off for 14 years. And when I first went to Russia and was working with Russian scientists on things like algorithmic math, they said they didn't have the capabilities. Don't trust them. Don't this, don't that. And here we are, you know, a $700 million company later. It's incredible. So when people say you can't do it, that's when I really want to do it. So believe in your dreams, stay positive. The glass is half full and not half empty. Don't let yourself get into the negative. Focus on the positive parts in your life. Focus on what you can do and think about getting that done and visualize. So go for it. And as we say at my company, I named it GSD for a reason. So get shit done. I don't think there's anything else I can add other than look to the stars as we talked about yesterday and you know, go bigger than you think you can because it is possible. It definitely is possible. And everyone here is an example of that as well. And to our investors, guys, thank you so much. That's, that was an inspiring closeout, one of the best that we've had here on VCTV. So thank you. To your audience, thank you so much for tuning in of today's episode of VCTV. We greatly appreciate you. As we've said, we're all available online 24 seven, whatever instant, uh, a social network it may be, reach out to us, connect. We'd love to hear more, love to answer questions and have conversations with each and every one of you. Thank you, Roberto, again, for sharing your uh, project with us today. Thank you to Elena and to the entire LA Token team for making VCTV possible. I'll put all as much as I can of the show notes in uh, today for all of you to follow up with each of our investors, but we are here for you. And again, thank you to our audience. If you like what you heard today, Click subscribe, give us a thumbs up. Investors, thank you. Elena, LA Token, thank you. I'm Kyle Lacott, your host. We'll be back here Monday morning for another edition and a full week ahead of VCTV. Everyone have a great weekend. Thank you, everybody.